Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Pleasure being here. You know, coming to Barcelona, I still remember when we went to, Na to Nice and Cannes 15 years ago. And it's amazing to see how this industry is shaping up and how things are coming together. Today, I want to talk about 5G and Internet of Things. When you talk about 5G, there's a little bit of a buzzword. Not many people really know what 5G is all about. The standards and the spec are being evolved. And as we're thinking about these elements, what I wanted to share with you today are three pressing questions. IoT and 5G in the aspects of how smart, how fast, and how connected. And hopefully, throughout uh, this presentation, I will share some perspective and some thoughts throughout the activities that Intel is performing throughout the industry. I want to start by saying, you know, when we think about 5G, it's more than just an evolution from 3 to 4G, etc. We are crossing a chasm right now. And being here in the conference looking four years from now, what does it really mean? Crossing the chasm has multiple dimensions. We're moving from a world where we manage voice and data into a world where we're managing knowledge. And managing knowledge has tremendous implications on the capabilities and the support infrastructure that needs to be in place in order for these applications to be for performed. It's not about the killer application anymore or the user experience and interfaces. It's about the immersed experience that the user is looking into. When 4G was all about bringing high quality HD data, YouTube, and then HD to the masses, 5G, it's about augmented reality. It's about 360 camera immersing experience and delivering it almost everywhere, every time, with the different uh, capabilities that are really distinguishing the user experience. So I want to talk about it today, how these user experiences are shaping up some technological trade-offs. When we think about 5G, what does it really mean when we're building all of these platforms? And as I said, we're in a chasm, and the answers for these questions I'm going to share with you today are not at the hand of one single company. It requires an industry to shape up the experiences that we're building. And that brings me to the second topic. What does it really mean when we're saying we're managing data moving into knowledge? The interactions that we're having between ourselves, think about the phone industry and communication, it was always about human interaction, whether it's voice moving into data. We're moving now into more and more interactions between people to machines. When you think about assisted cars and the capabilities of the sensor networks to sense what we really feel, the interactions and communication between the person to the machine is increasing. However, this is a limiting factor because the big issue here and the great opportunity is machine to machine. The amount of interaction between humans to machine, in my view, will be a limited factor. We're going to move more into machine to machine. And then there are some major issues about security, interactions, data aggregations, control and command. We're going to move from practical issues of software enablement into more ethical issues. When we talk about machine to machine, how do we inject the ethical complexity of deploying these technologies? So who's taking the control? Who's initiating the sessions? What does it mean? really. And at the end of the day, it brings us to a certain understanding that it's all about a virtuous cycle connecting all of these elements. And this is really important before talking about these three questions to understand what is the infrastructure that we're putting in place as an industry so we can capture all of these experiences. Many people probably have talked about the tens of billions of units that are going to be deployed throughout the coming 20, 30 years. The sensor networks and creating 
the edge of the network has multiple aspects. We're moving from a world when smart was just the beginning of the smartphone into the smart home, the smart city, the smart lighting, the smart water and, and sewer, and implementing all the sensor networks all over the place. But the sensor networks cannot operate without the cloud, the memory, and the data centers. These two elements are tightly integrated together, one to the other, and impact tremendous decisions when we design these systems and experiences. So it's not enough to think about an experience at the end of the device. It's not enough to think about what is the end product, whether it's a consumer electronics product, whether it's industrial internet, or any other at home, just looking into the end device without understanding the full circle and how is that going to impact the memory capabilities, the CPU capabilities, the networking storage capabilities, and all of the backbone that will be required to enjoy from what 5G has to offer. And that's basically bring us to another element that is changing. A very interesting question. What is the sensor of gravity? Think about communication. In the past, we moved from kind of, you know, like light signals to the fast pigeon delivering mail to the phone as being our hub and the center of our vitality, the safety net. The question that we have to ask ourselves in 5G, when we're collaborating and bringing multiple files to multiple devices, where is the center of gravity? Is it still remains with one device? Are we humans are the bottleneck for the center of gravity? Are we capable to rely on the center of gravity in the cloud? You heard Werner talking here before in the morning about Alexa and the experiences that Amazon has to offer. Just imagine that. You take the Echo device and putting it in your bedroom. It continues to sniff 24 by 7. To think about these experiences and what does it mean on the center of gravity. I know it sounds a, a little bit humoristic, but this is the practicality how life is going to be all about. And we are basically in a position when we have to surrender our data. When you think about 5G, and the population of the data, we are surrendering our data to the cloud. And by doing that, we choose to surrender our privacy. What are the security elements that are in place in order to enable that? I live in California, Silicon Valley. My youngest daughter at school, she's already been operating her homework throughout the Google experience. She doesn't even know that she had a trade-off. Her data, her information is already in the cloud. So when you think about the millennia and the transformation that we're having, we are already there. So let's talk about some of these questions and start by how smart. How smart 5G needs to be in order to be capitalizing on the opportunities. And I think that how smart is also relates to what are your battery life capabilities. When you want to deploy smartness, CPU enabled, there are multiple capabilities. It could be a small processing unit to a massive processing unit. If you think about some of the self-driving cars that are starting to emerge, this is basically data server on the wheels. How smart should it be? What's the reliability issue? If everything is being computed in the car to increase the security and safety, how smart self-driving car needs to be? How smart your smartwatch needs to be. Is it smart enough to enable your limited capabilities of data and analytics? Or it should compute everything on the device. These trade-offs are eventually impacting the form factors, the power consumption, battery life, and the experiences. If we want to compute 4K experience and transmit it in our existing data network communication, we're going to draw the battery very fast. If we want to transcode it from the cloud, there are different system implications to that. And that requires some very serious analytics and impacting the way we live our life. So I wanted to share with you 
few examples, and in particular, how smart you can be when you are enjoying yourself in the sport. Because the sport elements are critically also to our life. Our fun stuff, talking about experiences, are changing. They're changing because we are able today to inject compute capabilities and connectivity. I was talking about smart and connected into some of the use cases that were native in the past, with no connectivity, with no communication. Let's take a look at one of these examples. It will be nice if we can hear some audio. It's the show effect. This is where the wild things are. You can actually figure out how many times you rotated, how many G forces you left the takeoff with, how many G forces you landed with. A lot of insane stats that you never find out before we can find out now. It's crazy how much information they can get from a tiny device on your board. And technology is insane, man. People at home are now going to know what's actually happening here at the X Games. The fact that they can get it live on TV, it's going to make it so much more exciting, you know. So that was a perfect example of taking a traditional sports and applying some smartness to it. And you know, it's amazing because basically that was an ESPN um, uh, event. Based on these statistics, the snowboarders have found out that if you are running and you're landing at more than 15 G, yes, 15 G force on the ground, you're going to crack your snowboard. So just think about these kind of capabilities that never been before. So how fast? How fast our networks needs to be? And when we're talking about that, we're talking about data rates, we're talking about access to spectrum, we're talking about system reliability, and also some of the key requirements for the network itself. 5G will have to be prepared to support 20 gigabit per second with a one millisecond capabilities of latency on the edge. And the latency is as critical to the speed of the network. And how fast also depends on the user experience. How fast do you need to share your data when you are in the pan, personal area networks environment, or you're moving into the LAN circle, or you're moving into the WAN? And all of these questions are critical for not only the system capabilities, but also the capability to indulge the customer, to indulge the user with these experiences. So how fast, when you think about 5G, it's not only creating a new RANs on top of 4G, basically 3.7 to 4.2 gig. It's also deploying new FIs and exciting ones. We're talking about 28 and 39 gigabit per second. We're talking about 60 and 70. We're talking about backhaul. These kind of spectrums have never been shown in the user and devices that we are used to. That will require some very significant research and capabilities to bring the fastness to the user while we're moving from one circle to the other. When we move from the PAN to the LAN and to the one experience, how fast will be determined by the capabilities of the end device to work on the network topology, the RF, and the capabilities of those. 
Now, I've been playing with the mobile and communication for more than 20 years, and I can share with you that 5G is very exciting. It is exciting because this is not a linear evolution. This is exponential evolution, basically trying to immerse all of the spectrums to lead us into other elements that people are talking to. How connected? How fast has an immediate link to the how connected circle? And just think of the following. If we're talking about 60 gigahertz, the capability of 60 gigahertz to impress the user is enormous. We're talking about uncompressed video. To the ones who have been playing with networks and communication, you typically know that if you need to take a 4K or DVD capabilities and quality to transfer it over the air requires latency, how to break the 50 millisecond per, uh, down, and how do you take a huge amount of data and you transfer the files from one device to the other. So when you think about that, we have to remember that the connected element has a high correlation to the network density. And the network density is clogged. So we can't really talk about 5G without understanding that it's a capacity issue. How connected, in my mind, is totally related directly to the capacity issue. What are we doing in order to densify the networks? So our vision and our goal is to bring the networks close to the users. So you'll see a huge emergence of something that's called small cells. And breaking this data center into data towers, into many, many small cells that have the capability to surround ourselves with the wider pipes and to connect it to the backhaul. All of these uh, uh, questions are critically important on the profile, the investment profile for the carriers. When we talk about how connected, we have to think about what is the cost per bit. it back to civil use will not be effective. These are the key elements. So I would say the following. It's all about the experience. So I want to repeat that again. When we talk about how smart and how much of compute power we have to put, whether it's a wearable device or any other sensor in the network, or what is the compute power on the residential gateway side, what is the computing power that you guys need to demand to have locally at your home? How much is enough? What is the minimum that you are willing to pay for? If the computing power is in the cloud and it's tightly connected and you have the reliability, why would you invest locally in your home in these infrastructures? Now, don't get me wrong, I'm from Intel, so I love to sell you some chips and devices. But the real question for us as users is how to take all of these questions and deliver the best solutions to connect all of the knowledge that we have to impact our experiences. Some of these key questions that I'm sharing you here will not be addressed by one company. And in order for us to do a good job, we need to expand the ecosystem. Not always you can target the right players at the right time. As I share with you in the sports example, and we are deploying it right now to an NBA. If you've seen the Super Bowl 10 days ago, we worked in another technology, 3D, 
to have basically 360 real-time experience so you can sit in the home and you can control your experience of the real-time live game is being shown. All of these uh, elements are not done by one company. It's huge amount of uh, research and, and development in order to put the platforms out there for us to incentivize people to take advantage of it. Uh, it's, a, it's a sea of an opportunities. And what I wanted to do, I wanted to leave some time for Q&A. But before doing that, just let me share with you a little bit just to spark your imagination the sea of opportunities that we believe that's existing. Let's run the following video and then go to Q&A. Audio, please. I assume this conference is still on the startup stage. <laughs> What's nice about this video, all the things that you've seen are not futuristics. All of these are real life experiences that we are able to support today. So just imagine what can we do when we have a very wide